Okay. Okay. Do I have to continue this meeting? It's being recorded. I guess. Yeah, just so. continue. I think. Okay. I hate wearing these pluggy things, but I can't hear without it properly. Oh, no. Yeah, a lot of people need to wear those. Yeah, it helps you to hear yourself. I, think. I agree. I don't know yeah. half the things I'm saying until I'm done saying them. <laughs> Yeah. And you would. Okay, I'm admitting people now. Hello, while you turn your audios on, <laughs> welcome to the Zoom universe. Um, we're just gonna start in a few minutes. We're waiting for some people to join. But in the meantime, hi, I'm Ryan. Um, and welcome to McNally Jackson Digital Reading, um, Digital Book Launch. <laughs> and yeah, I, we're just gonna start in a few minutes. But I was just talking to Anne, asking her where, where she was. I know that, um, Rosie, you said, where were you, where are you currently right now? I'm in Saratoga Springs, New York. Oh, wonderful. Oh my goodness. So we're across all over. <laughs> I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Um, great. All righty. So what's me. that room you're in, Rosie? That's my studio here. Wow. It's yeah. huge. Really big. <laughs> it's the Helen Frankenthaler studio. So uh -huh. it's gotta be big. Helen, Helen has quite an echo effect. Yes. <laughs> I guess I need to fill it up some more. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, pillows, whatever. Popcorn. Popcorn. Oh, that's great. Movie night. <laughs> this right. is not movie night. <laughs> you can go on to movie night after this. But. Yeah, Ryan, what are you screening for us? Um, oh yeah, I'm certainly not screening the Trojan Women movie because that was that was against. <laughs> I, I read that little interview where it was not good to. I I mean my my experience with Trojan Women was not the movie. It was the I was in a drama class, so I had to perform it. But I was not I was not one of the women. I was, oh, yeah. who were you? I was um I was the person the crow I equivalent. <laughs> I was the, the person the jailer. Um, Alphibius, the messenger. Yeah. yeah. Oh, messenger. cool. Well, he's the only sympathetic character, really. It's true. That's 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 one of my favorite characters to play. But it was still it's very. And then I saw it at La Mama when they were doing an immersive section again. Immersive mm. So it's been quite a journey. All right. <laughs> <laughs> let us let us begin. Um, hi everyone. Let's begin. <laughs> I'm Ryan, um, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the next coming weeks. So please keep an eye out or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming on. Um, there'll be a time at the end of tonight's conversation uh, for questions. So start thinking about them now. You can put them in the chat or you can direct message them to me if you prefer to be anonymous. Um, and we'll get to them towards the later part of the event. Um, we're glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during these difficult times in our little Brady Bunch boxes. <laughs> As we weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. So if you enjoy free events like this one and want to keep hosting us to keep hosting more of them, please buy some books from us online. The Trojan Women book is going to be linked in the chat as well as some of the other books by both of these authors. And um, you can just click on them and order them for pickup or for delivery. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce both of our lovely guests. The first one, the first guest is Rosanna Bruno. She's an artist who makes paintings, comics, and bad puns, <laughs> which I relate very. to. <laughs> very, very bad. Very bad. Puns. No puns. No puns? Is that? <laughs> Little puns. Well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to see. We'll see. <laughs> her first book, The Slanted Life of Emily Dickinson, was published in 2017. And this is her second, her second big one. <laughs> um, so our next guest is Anne Carson, who was born in Canada and teaches ancient Greek for a living. So thank you guys so much for joining me. <laughs> From all across, all over. <laughs> If puns involved, maybe we'll still we'll still figure that out. Um, so I would love to open it up for um, a bit of reading before we start questions and start the conversation. So who would like to what what would you like to per, to read first within this? 
I think we decided, Rosie and I decided to read two passages. One is just me and one is uh, where Rosie and I will read together a dialogue. So the first passage is the, um, the first speech of Hecabe in the play. Hecabe is the queen of Troy. And she has just been the victim of the Trojan War, which eliminated her whole family, pretty much, and her husband and her city. And she's um, been reduced to the lowest condition a human being can reach. In the book, um, Rosie represented uh, Hecabe as a dog. All the women of the chorus, all the Trojan women are either dogs or cows, and they're herded around here and there because they're now slaves. Mm -hmm. Hecabe is the lead dog. And in this passage, which, as I say, is her first speech, she's um, lying in the corner of the stage with her head on her paws, and then she lifts her head and says the following. Uh, enter Hecabe, an ancient emaciated sled dog of filth and wrath. She lifts her head. Hecabe, start me up, nostrils. Start me up, left leg. Troy is no more. We are no more. Our luck changed. Tricky God, that luck. Am I supposed to cry out something like, alas, alas? Because my homeland is a ruin, my children wiped out, my husband murdered, and a whole hierarchy of ancestors erased as if they had never been. Silence is just as good. Or is silence too good? What are words for? Have I ever been as bad as this? No, I've never been as bad as this. Can't even turn over, can't turn my face to the wall. There is no wall. All my bruised decades are rattling their verdicts to cry out. What are cries for? Can we strangle the muse? I hate ships, I hate Greek ships. You with your pathological prows and your spasms of war and the original sin of your sails. One scorching noon, you came licking and lapping at the shore of Troy. You came hunting that female, Menelaus female, who, as it happened, was up on the high diving board in stilettos, and from there somehow managed to murder all Priam's 50 sons, and Priam and me she drove to this. Here I am on the ground by the tent of Agamemnon, a slave, an old slave, I avoid the term raped. You'd find it grotesque to imagine the rape of a dry old dog like me, wouldn't you? Well, look at those young ones and feel pity. Brides of Troy, brides of a blasted contract. Troy is extinct and no bird sings. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh man. That was Hecabe. Should we do the other reading? Yeah, uh, Ryan, I think the order is a little- Oh, that's okay. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll fix it. I'll fix it and change okay. to it. If you guys are, for the audience, we are, I'm putting the screenshots from the, from the, the comic slash graphic novel, The Trojan Women that we were just discussing earlier. So this is just the screenshots of it. Oh yeah, I forgot um, to mention that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Should we go mouse? Oh, okay. No. Okay. Let me go back to this. I'm gonna. I'm gonna kick back. We. I we think... start at. Um... Uh, that was you. You just were on that page. Here it is. Yep. Wonderful. Oh, I'm sorry. Back to the. Um... Uh, Here we go. There you go. Uh, wonderful. We're no, read... that's the gear, isn't it? No, this is the one from where and Andromache enters. Oh, for we're going forward. I thought you were going back to show Hecabe. Okay. Oh yeah, if you wanted to do that. Yeah, we can show Hecabe. I'm sorry, I I was I I the no, it's okay. We didn't we didn't tell you because we didn't figure out how to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Never done it before. So We're this all is learning. Hecabe, uh, 
raising her head and speaking what I just said. Okay, we can go forward now. I just really want to ask real quick to Rosie. So did you use watercolor for the bottom part of the panel? Like what, what gives you that sort of washed out feeling? It's actually just a washed out ink. Wow, that's so cool. Um, <laughs> that's what I was curious about. <laughs> I wanted her to look like she's disappearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so here's the second part of the reading. Okay, so this part is a dialogue between Andromache, who's a, who was the wife of Hector. Mm. Hector's been killed. And um, she talks with Hecabe. And Andromache is represented as a poplar tree with trunk split and roots dragging out the back of the cart. She comes along um, on, a, on a wooden cart as uh, a ripped out piece of tree. Enter Andromache. My Greek masters are taking me away. Alas. Don't start. The dark. Is everywhere. The gods. Are useless. The children. All dead. I have a knife in my head. Can you help me? Probably not. I was a queen. I had a husband. Is that the city howling? It's the smoke howling. If I go to Hades. And why not go to Hades? I'll meet all my children. It was your first fucking born who brought on this war. Yes, it was. Bloodstained bodies all the way from here to Greece. All your fault. Yes, it was. Then again, who cares? We lost. We can't go on. We don't go on. We're ended. It was a city with houses and children and us. It ended. If we were dead, we wouldn't have to remember. Chorus. Tears. 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 Loose the tears. gears. You're the mother of Hector. You killed more Greeks than anyone. What do you see when you look at all this? I see gods at work. Whatever goes up high, they pull down low. It's the contrast stuns me. Yesterday, we were royal persons living unexamined lives. Now what? Necessity is the name for that. Just now they came and took Cassandra. Oh no, not Cassandra. Has some second Ajax appeared? But I have other news for you. Bad news. A little more bad news. Aren't we topped out? They murdered Polyxena on Achilles' grave as an offering. Oh, I go to Lina. Oh no. Oh no. So that's what Talthibius meant. The riddle is clear. I saw her myself. I got down from my cart and wrapped her in cloth. And they called in an offering. That stinks. Death is death. In a way, she's lucky. No, she's not. Don't confuse things like that. Death is nothing. Life has hope. That's the reading. Thank you so much. I want to know what is what what is oi to line that? What does that translate to? And I realized that that was the Greek. Um, well, it thinking? really doesn't translate. It's usually rendered as alas or mm -hmm. something like that. It just means it's a scream. You know, mm -hmm. screams are um, not translatable and yet not meaningless. There are sounds that have sense, but not oh, and they can't construe them. <sighs> That's what it is. And this part really, it the inversion, Rosie, of white to black with, um, with, with I presume, just a different type of, did you use a different marker for this? Or how did you get to this, this, this point? Yes, yeah, so I used a white ink marker. Um, and um, yeah, I wanted to be very stark and bleak and um, highlight Andromache in a way that was trying to convey her suffering. It's, it was one of the most like striking parts of the book for me was to see the inversion of color with this bad news, like a harbinger to change the form. Um, so mm -hmm. I really commend you for that. <laughs> that really it messed with me. <laughs> um, and I just had some questions. Um, it's also pretty ask. amazing the way, way 
Rosie has made a talking tree yeah. plausible <laughs> somehow. I'm not sure the drawing gives the tree plausibility that you wouldn't necessarily think it has on the page. Yeah. Well, you made her the tree. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But see, I'd like to emphasize here that Rosie had to do the hardest part of this because I just wrote down the words and then she had to figure out how to make the words and all the metaphors and everything in them into images that would convey the sense of the imagery, but also make room for all this text. And I think it's just really amazing uh, achievement it. on her part. Um, well, I, I'm not just trying to return a compliment, but please, as you may remember, you had asked me to read, when you asked me to work on this project, you told me to read it, um, read a translation because you hadn't finished yours yet. Mm -hmm. And yet you would not give me a translation to pick up. You wouldn't tell me which one. And <laughs> <laughs> in, in classic Anne fashion. Um, <laughs> So I got one that I thought would be good because um, it was included in a book that you were in, an anthology that you were in. And I'm sure it is good, but I didn't see anything. I didn't see images. Um, mm. And I was concerned because I really wanted to do the project and I, I was upset that I didn't think I could. And then you gave me your translation and that's all I saw were images. And yeah, I remember you said that at the time and I, and I was surprised, but then I thought about it and the images are all there in the original thing, but somehow people don't read for visuality, I guess, mm. because it's supposed to be a different world, especially when it's a, a world so framed in the academic Anyway, well, so tell yeah. me about that. How did how did you find the original images? And then I would love to see the, I would love to know about the devising process of specifically coming up with the chorus of dogs and cows, um, hmm. and how that was sent back and forth between the two of you. Because <laughs> <laughs> what is oh. That? oh yeah, that's right. I sent I sent you that, didn't I? Yes. I rem yeah, the chorus is always a problem in translating a Greek play because they're mm. collective, but they're also individuals. Mm. So I was thinking for some reason that mug shots of the dogs would be a way to do that. And then I just found that book with the examples of dog, you know, <laughs> mug shot sort of structures. So I sent it to her and I think that's one of the best pages. This is a dog sticker book. Send to um. that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on that. See, you can see. Yeah, the there it is. All the different kinds of dogs, and I also knew that Rosie loves drawing dogs, so I thought it'd be <laughs> a really fun day for her to have this page to do. No, when I when I got this book, I was so excited because I hadn't shown any Anne anything yet that I had been working on, and I hadn't gotten to this page yet. And um, so when, when she gave me the book, not only did I love the book because it's a bunch of dogs, but I realized I could pretty much do anything here. <laughs> and, um, I didn't have to feel uh, worried that my interpretation might be a little far out. And mm. you know, I just felt free to do it. And yeah. so that was a great beginning for me. Yes, yeah. amazing. I'm so curious as to um, certain aspects of the strangeness that comes with um, some of the characters. I know that um, Menelaus, if, for those of you who hasn't gotten it yet, Menelaus, who is the king, the Greek king um, mm -hmm. that, that has um, Helen as a wife and Helen is then taken away or runs away. And um, the war, the Trojan War has begun partly in, because of Paris and, um, and Menelaus and their feud. Um, but Menelaus is shown as a gearbox. Um, yeah. And I wanted to, I was, that was the part that I, the like, one question that I wanted to get out because I'm so fascinated by that. And it made me think about just reconstructing. I mean, I could think about it literally or academically, but then there's a part of the spiritually that just made sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. On top of my logical brain, there was a part that I was just like, that is Menelaus as a gearbox and I was believing mm -hmm. it. So how did you guys come about 
um, creating this gearbox king of Greece. Well, I, I think I put the gearbox in and then Rosie was stuck with the problem of visualizing a gearbox <laughs> that talks in the middle of a bunch of animals. So I don't know how she did that, but the reason I made them a gear, well, first of all, I made the Trojan women animals, obviously because they're reduced to subhuman status. But the Greeks are, are the Greek, army are even less somehow mm -hmm. um, ontologically and spiritually than animals so what could that be well they'd have to be stuff you know tools mm -hmm. and menelaus as you may remember if in your classics course if they read the iliad menelaus is kind of a second rate hero he's the brother of agamemnon agamemnon takes command of the expedition even though it's uh supposed to be going after Menelaus' wife. And Menelaus kind of runs around behind his brother all through the Iliad trying to get his attention. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, then he has to be just a tool that facilitates the moving of other tools and the accomplishment of other tasks. And that's why I threw in the gear. But I was really doubt, doubting my wisdom in doing that because I thought it would be really hard to draw, you know, a talking mm -hmm. gearbox somehow she did it <laughs> Rosie, Rosie did it perfectly I want to show yeah. I can hold it up to my camera some of the the points in which the gearbox protrudes and you get this <laughs> like 3d depth that just yeah like, consumes and adds like power to to what he's saying which <laughs> blew my mind <laughs> yeah he has well, power also he is last year's model so. <laughs> that is oh, true. <laughs> I love those subtle touches that Rosie puts in. <laughs> I but might I, not have known that. I didn't even know what a gearbox looked like. So I did, I just did a lot of research. Mm. And then I started to play around with some sketches. And I remember sending you a couple. And because, mm -hmm. um, there were some that didn't have as many turning parts. <laughs> this one had a lot of turning parts and, I, and, and this one was the one we decided on. And I have yeah. to say that in terms of something drawing something difficult or not difficult, what was great about this project is that there were so many interest, interesting things to draw. It was very unpredictable. And I remember sitting down to draw uh, Athena as a pair of overalls. And I just started laughing and I just was so grateful that I was doing this <laughs> because it was just fun for me. So. I love, I think that's amazing. <laughs> I, I, I laughed out loud at the, the beer garden where I was reading this when I was, I probably looked a little in, kind of insane, but I, I did think that, that, that those drawings, I, there, you have such a way, and I noticed it in your previous book, The Slanted Life of Emily Dickinson, Rosie, where it, it just feels both, there's the weight of an object or a person, and yet there's the more funny and more absurd parts of a person as well. And I think that that is, that is so well fit for a Euripides drama where, where there's absurdity amongst this dark heaviness going on throughout the entire piece, piece of theater. Mm. Um, and I just wanted to commend you for, for that. I'd be interested to know, Ryan, since mm. you're um, a fresh reader of this book, did that seem to you inappropriate, that juxtaposition, not in the slanted life that Rosie did before, but in this book of the comic and the tragic? You know what I mean? I have, a, I mean, I have my gripes with higher academia and their throttling of classical Greek works because <laughs> I feel that when I read it first in high school, not to knock my high school, but it was very deadpan and we were looking at all the different images. And I, I consistently kept asking, why does it have to be the specific way? Why is there an analytical, why is there such an analytical history of, the, it's not being lived. The words aren't being said out loud and they're not being mm -hmm. performed. And to, it reminds me of something that Vic, Victor Shlovsky says during, um, um, oh my gosh, I had the quote right here. I love having quotes. Uh, <laughs> it reminds me of something that Victor Shlovsky said during um, the um, critic. <laughs> mm -hmm. He talks about poetry is trying to make the stone stony, like tr attempting oh, yeah. to reconceptualize mm -hmm. a, an image into something that's felt. And I always took that to be um, 
making something a little bit strange in order to feel it deeply. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what threw me from the first moment of Poseidon being a wave into Athena being a pair of jeans with a mask on, it threw me off my rhythm of the analytical brain where, where I was yeah. like, oh, I know what Greek plays are like. And it threw me into this visceralness of, of hmm. a poetry show or of a, of a comic hmm. book. Um, and I love the hmm. use of including it as a comic because it's yeah. not a graphic novel. <laughs> it felt like a comic series. <laughs> um, it does. So That's good. That's I, interesting. Because I wondered about that. Maybe the audience might have views on that too when we get to the <laughs> audience. Because it, okay. it is a problem. I mean, I think my sense of it was that it, um, we've learned from Beckett that tragedy mm -hmm. and, and jokes are sort of side by side somewhere in the bottom of the psyche. So uh, it always makes sense to me, but I'm not, I wasn't sure if it did to anyone else. Sorry, Rosie, I cut you off there. No, I, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but I remember um, this might also be why the, the first translation didn't resonate with me that I read because you, I was not aware that Euripides was funny. Mm. Um, because <laughs> Um, I read your translation and there was humor and I thought it was your humor and actually you told me that it was Euripides, that he mm -hmm. has humor in, I mean, obviously, yeah. maybe not as much as we put in this book, but mm. um, there were lines that I thought were yours that you said came directly from Euripides and, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we had had a conversation about people being afraid of that, so maybe yeah. We did, uh, yeah. Translate it in, like the translation I read, I don't remember humor at all. No, I think people are afraid, afraid of that. Hmm. I think that that's a, that's a very interesting, when did you first, when did both of you first come into contact with this play? And what was your interpretation and how was it given to you? Because I, I like to think of as an audience member picking this up or someone reader picking this up and being like, hmm, Trojan women, I heard I should get to this. And mm -hmm. this being the first example of someone inter interacting with this Greek myth. Um, so that I wanna know, when did you first both interact with it? Hmm. You did I, it first then. <laughs> yeah, I must have, yeah. I think I probably read it in school cause I did, I did classics, but I don't, I didn't ever want to teach it. I think because uh, sometime pretty early in life, I saw that movie of it. You know, that movie that has <laughs> Catherine Hepburn and Genevieve Bougeot and uh, who else? Irene Pappas, I think. Oh, it's unbearable. <laughs> anyway, Vanessa, put me off. Have you ever seen that, Rosie? No, and in fact, you said, don't see that. Oh, did I? <laughs> well, that was harsh of me, but anyway. No, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of avoided it from then until, well, actually till now, but mm. I don't know. For some reason, it seemed to be a play suitable to our strange pandemic times and everything else now. I always like to say one of the chat people said the jagged attempt at a chorus seems Zoom fitting. And I had to agree <laughs> with the, the, the dogs felt like they were, they yeah. were in the Zoom calls with little <laughs> East individual mug shot, mug shots. So yes, that's yeah. true. That was yeah. prophetic. Yeah. <laughs> prophetic. Did you ever read it in school, Rosie? Or No. In fact, um, I had never read it. And um, yeah. There you and go. I read, but I did read yours was the first translation, and I read your uh, translation of Hecuba, the Euripides Hecuba. Mm -hmm. so, oh, man, Hecuba is such an interesting character to portray as an old dog. It reminded me when I was reading it, the first image of her of the pups suckling at at her teeth um, was. It reminded me of the Romulus and Remus myth of like mm -hmm. a she wolf, and I know that Hecuba in the later play does sort of get turned into a dog for a light, later part before she is put to mm -hmm. death. Yeah, that's part of the legend. It's not included in this play, but it's part of the legend about her. But yeah, it just seemed to me uh, a, an animal that has enormous 
dignity no matter mm. what happens to it and bad things are always happening to dogs yeah, yeah. and she was a sled dog in, in yes that sled that dog a life of work pulling yeah. weight and, yeah and, other people's and, weight all the time other, and, yeah and a lot of reproduction in the legend she and priam have 50 sons it, there's no real explanation of how that works biologically but <laughs> At this point, anyway, in her life, they're all dead but one, so I guess it doesn't matter. Oh my goodness. So how did, um, and I, I was so curious as to when the trend, when you were putting this text into a new translation, um, it felt so colloquial, and yet these, um, these translations are also elegant. So there was an aesthetic choice on top of this colloquial language. Does, does how long have the translations and the words been swimming around in your head before you were getting it out on paper? Um, or does it take, did this all happen in the course of one furious night of translating? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, not one night, let's say one season. I think I did it in less than a year, which is, yeah, pretty fast for that sort of work. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I don't know exactly. I think, um, a lot of translation as it for me is first thought best thought often but um i do go over and over things and try to dig the words out of the words so but i don't really remember how long how long it took or how how it worked really mm. you look yes. up the words in the dictionary and write them down so. <laughs> That's what my translator teachers tell me as well, which <laughs> it drives me insane. I cannot, um, but you're mm -hmm. right, that is true. And Rosie, I'm so curious to know, um, this, this black and white art style is reminiscent for me of the photocopying zine 90s era, like, like <laughs> cartoons that I, would, that I would receive in pamphlets. So who are, but I'm wondering, who are some of your inspirations for illustrations? And um, when did you decide to become more of this, this illustrator, of specifically poets? I mean, these, these two poets are going up against Emily Dickinson and Euripides. <laughs> these are big shots. Um, and yet you do them so wonderfully. <laughs> well, Emily Dickinson didn't really have a choice, but, uh, <laughs> but Anne did, and I'm grateful she chose me. But I, I actually, um, I'm a painter and that's my, mm. I mean, I don't really care about the categories, but um, so I'm used to actually working in color. That is really what I what I love about painting, and it's like another language in itself. Yeah. It's not about um, words or or anything else, and I can't really I sometimes can't even talk about it. Uh, but I also love um, poetry and um, literature and. So this was a great way to combine sort of the visual, my visual art and my love of poetry and words. Mm. Um, and there's something interesting about, I mean, it's a very conscious decision to just do it in black and white. It's almost like not a crossover yeah. in my other worlds. Um, mm. And visually, I think it's very powerful. Uh, so, but as far as people, cartoonists and comic artists, I love. I um, I love Linda Barry's work, mm -hmm. which um, is not quite, uh, you know, this way, you know, this way exactly. But um, she does great dogs and she draws great dogs, mm -hmm. and I think she's really um, her work is very. Um, I don't know, just it's heartfelt, it's human, you know, it's, mm. it's incredible and very powerful. Uh, I like Alison Bechtel. Oh, yeah. um, and I like Raj Chast. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, they're all very apparent in that. I think that that's, um, that's, and I, and yet that this is entirely a new type of style with the thicker line work that I, I appreciated. And it made me <laughs> want to start doodling them out, which is a very good thing when it comes to illustrations or um, comics, because I want to start recreating them on little napkins and places. Um, so, well, yeah, I, 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 there's actually a question in the chat right now that said, do the words always come first for this project or do the words ever change once the images come to life? I think the words came first. Yeah, I did the whole thing and then sent it to Rosie and 
I didn't think about the words after that. Mm. And what, how fast did it take for the words, for the images, Rosie, to, I know you said that they came almost instantaneously after Anne's, after Anne's, Anne's sent her translation over, but um, how long did it take to like figure it and tighten up the gears, so to speak, of the, of the illustrations and the characters? It actually took a while because um, when I was reading the translation, I saw imagery and I knew that I could do, could, or I wanted to do this, that it was exciting for me. Uh, but I, wor I worked in a very strange way for this project. I just had Anne's translation printed out mm -hmm. and I read it through maybe twice. And um, each day I would take a page or two, depending on what um, ideas I had. And I would just deal with that page and then turn the page and deal with that page. And, um, and occasionally I would keep the previous page that I drew mm -hmm. in front of me so that I had that to, to work from. Uh, but I never worked like that before. It was, I never worked without like a, an overview mm. thinking, like I didn't know what it was gonna look like. Yeah. Every day I sat down and I didn't, even though it's pretty cohesive, I didn't know what the page, next page was going to be. <laughs> That's so nice. That's, again, I think that I could speak for most poets when I think of like, I, I just wanna pick an illustrator's brain. <laughs> I think that it's so fascinating to see how images come in, in mm. different waves, in different wavelengths. I, I have another mm. question for you, Anne, if that's okay. Um, mm. um, there seems to be a concern in most of your works that we cannot know the ancient Greek figures and that we are projecting ourselves and thinking that we can know them. Is that less of a concern in the comic medium, which allows for more creative license? Hmm. I don't know, actually, I don't think no, I don't think it's less of a concern. I wouldn't, I don't know. It's not a concern. I think it's, it's a great benevolence of mm. other languages, works in other languages that they bring you to that crack in reality where you realize other people really are different. Mm. You're not going to understand Hecabe because you just can't enter that life. And I think that's an important, um, an important realization because mm. it's nice to think everybody's just like us. That's great. Uh, yeah, that is very nice to think. <laughs> and it's nice to think that these, it, it's empathetic to think that they're just like us. I, I'm curious about the, in, the, the use of stage directions in both of you. I mean, again, I, I love the, the keeping of stage directions for my little dramatist heart, but um, I think that to use it very deliberately acts as this almost Brechtian theater style of, of storytelling. And mm -hmm. did you think that that, what did that give for you? Like, why did you choose to include that personally? Uh, well, as you say for the storytelling, because it is um, a, a bit weird for a reader to open a, supposedly a translation of a Greek play and find it's full of animals and elements and gearboxes so there was a need to explain that but i didn't want to turn into what's his name um miller what's his first name arthur arthur, arthur miller you know when you start a play of arthur miller you get two pages of description of the furniture in the room that they're entering on scene one and just drove me off the wall so i was trying to give the story uh, the context of the strange things, strange elements we introduce with the animals and so on without a lot of extra verbiage. So that that was the whole intention there. It's just explicative of the, the weird framing that we've given to the story. <laughs> I love that. I also um, just wanna add that when I first started working with the text, I was very concerned about breaking up the where the line breaks were. Yeah. But in comics, that is not, you know, you don't group things that way. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it was, I think I did it maybe 90, I preserved the, the line breaks maybe 94% of the time. <laughs> 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 and um, and there was only one instance where Anne made me change one of the breaks that I didn't preserve. Mm. So 
I thought that was a really interesting way to approach this because it is a comic, but it, um, I wanted to keep that structure that mm. Anne had as much as I could. Huh. I think you managed to do it successfully. I, I definitely, I, I was, at times, some of the dialogues between the two, it felt like it was a, a continuous wave until I would then realize who was talking. And in a way, there was sort of a chorus on top of that, just from sh figuring out where the little bubbles would lead to in the character. <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. I, I appreciated that. <laughs> um, I'm just going to open it up to some questions that are in the audience, if that's OK. OK. Um, I'm gonna run for a second and get my uh, plug because my battery's dying. Oh no! <laughs> stay stay alert. Stay alive. Okay. Oh goodness. Meanwhile, I see Denise Newman in the audience. Hi, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Denise Newman actually asked, "Could could yeah, we'll start with you, Anne? Could this? Uh, could you imagine this might be performed? And how could you imagine this might be performed?" You know, I'd like to think it could be performed, but the opening scene is Poseidon. Um, comes on stage as a wave of water, six cubic feet of water. So I kind of paused there imagining that it could ever <laughs> be performed on stage, but you know, video and so on can do lots nowadays. So um, yeah, yes and no, <laughs> yes and no. I would be, I mean, I'm open to any kinds of ideas you might have about that. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> we could work it in as a climate change uh, play. That wave come in. Oh yeah, get, fu <laughs> get funding that way. <laughs> okay, well, okay. Uh, worth thinking about. That seriously, yeah, you could, you can. <laughs> I'm not above the Arto philosophy of getting the audience a little bit wet before <laughs> they, before they experience theater. Mm. I think. Um, oh goodness, yeah. there's. Um, there's a couple questions in this chat. Wow. Okay. Um, okay. Let's go through it all. Huh. I'm saying. All right. This one's first one by um, Lauren Campbell. Um, I love seeing the story in this new medium and how it can defamiliarize the story. I have a question for Anne. There seems to be concern with most of the works that we cannot know ancient. Oh, sorry. That's that's um, figures. We've been there. Yourself. We did there. That was the one that we already did. Haha, uh -huh. wonderful. Um, all right. I'm fascinated with the idea of characters portraying, portraying characters as dogs. On the one hand, it's an example of defamiliarization, but also most modern audiences feel pity for suffering dogs that are suffering humans. In reading Hecabe as, uh, in your reading, Hecabe asks, what are cries for? If you had an answer to that question, what would you say? Each of you. Oh, man. Strange. What are <laughs> cries for? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I guess it comes at that place where the Greek words intervene. So I guess cries are to be untranslatable. If they were translatable, they'd be words. Yeah, it goes back to the concept that we were talking about. You were talking about with performing, like the, there are some parts, there are some beats, there are some lines that you can't, no matter how many times you try and play right, and they will try to interpret that this one way, say this this one way. There's always a part that's untranslatable, unsayable, that the actor just you have to trust that they're gonna understand. Mm -hmm. Well, also in this in this play, I, I would think of it as. Um, almost like it's futile, you mm. know, what are cries for when mm -hmm. no one's listening, you know, when no one's um, Yeah. Attention. Yeah, that's, oh goodness. I wanna ask that, I wanna ask Rosie now, like how did you manage to get to grapple with the visualizations of such horrible circumstances um, and how did it like, how did it manifest in your body? And also did, um, did that, did working through that sort of open anything up? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> as, as one does. <laughs> um, when I, the reason I wanted to read the Andromache uh, Hecabe 
dialogue is that when I, that was the first time I really hit a wall in terms of how to draw something because it was the two of them encapsulating that long lament. I mean, they were just comparing um, scars, you know, mm. battle scars. And, um, and I remember sitting down and looking at the wall for a lot, a long time and not being sure how to do it. Mm. And I spent a lot of time just sitting and it was really weird and it made me feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I found mm. that if I just sat and yeah. not, it didn't get up and distract myself and move around, but I found a way in. And one, one of the ways that I dealt with it in the whole book was liter making the metaphors literal, you know, just kind mm -hmm. of taking them and illustrating them in a way. And sometimes they come out being absurd, like and said, a talking tree um, in the darkness. Um, and you kind of believe it and the way Andromache is holding the sapling, um, her son is, you know, kind of a branch, a tree branch hand, and it's very um, tender. And uh, so I just found a way to turn it inside out, you know, just take the words and draw what they say. Mm. And that was a way to accentuate the metaphor in a deeper way you know it seems absurd but it actually brings you back deeper into the mm -hmm. into the emotional um center of the piece yeah i completely agree with that it really did um it it, it was the same it worked the same way as um some of the stage directions did where it, it brought me back to thinking out of my game into the visceral um, which was mm. beautiful. So thank you for that. I, I have another question by Jenny. Um, do two of you feel um, that the illustrations implicit humor in a way intensified the emotions of the story? Um, <laughs> and someone says, I'm having a hecuba time restraining myself from punning, Rosie. So that's gonna, <laughs> that's your one pun that you get. <laughs> I think that's a friend of mine. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Let's start with you, Rosie. Yeah, I think I think um, I know we discussed this before, and I think the humor actually intensifies mm. um, the tenor, the emotional tenor of the the work. I think the humor makes it more tragic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I guess I think so too. I don't know why though. I really don't know why. Mm. I mean, not just here. I mean, in Beckett or anything like that. I don't know why. Do you think it's it's um it's a little bit of it makes the tragic more tragic, but it gives you also a little bit of a reprieve for that moment of humor. Like there's like this weird back and forth. I think that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, like the humor is a way in, but then once you're in, you realize how tragic it is. Does that mm -hmm. feel like something that might be working? Yeah, I don't know. It has something to do with what you can do with your face. Mm. You know, an extreme grief contorts the face in the same way as um, extreme laughter does. Right. So that it's like they meet at the back, the too much and the too little. But it, maybe just because we're so limited as human beings, that's the whole circumference that we have, you know. But I, I'm not sure. Well, it had me thinking about the concept of comedy and tragedy, similar to the black and white of the page, how mm. they both like align and highlight each other. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I, again, I, I, I love the use of no colors within this. Um, I thought it really brought out parts of the part of both comedy and tragedy kind of mishing together. Yeah. Um, just one, one question asks, um, Hecabee is lying down on the ground during a lot of this play. A dog mm -hmm. lying down is not the same as a human lying down. 
do you think making her a dog makes her more dignified or, or resignated figure or tragedy less visceral? Hmm. Yeah, I think we've already met yeah. that issue. But yes, I do think that dogs are inherently dignified, mm. but also quite funny and willing to be funny. Yeah. And also kind of kicked around by life a lot. And you can definitely tell when a dog is sad and it says yeah. it on their face. It says it in their mm -hmm. eyes. That's why one of my favorite images in there is just the nose, repeated nose on Hecuba's eyes. Sad eyes, it. yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, I think also um, people have said to me that the, the dogs hmm. look like they could be your pets. And hmm. so, of course, you know, they don't look like wild dogs. You know, they look yeah. like they just um, left your home, you know, they just had a nice cozy life mm -hmm. in someone's house and, um, and now they're on their way to being slaves. So. Whereas Helen in the play, who's also a female, is a wolf, right? Yeah. Fox, a fox. Fox, yeah. and silver fox. Yeah, silver fox. And she has... Uh, the, the dog shape, but it's way more malevolent. Mm. Well, the only other person that's not a dog, besides the, the Greeks who are cats and Menelaus, is Cassandra. Mm. So I Cassandra's a human, yeah. She's Cassandra. the only human. I, because she's different, you know? She mm. is different from all the humans. And if the humans are gearboxes and dogs, then uh, Cassandra has to be something, a step up let's say mm. she's but more more than human i also love that decision because she is different and it makes her more oddball mm. you know, mm -hmm. she's already an oddball and by making her human ironically she's the odd person the yes odd figure mm. in the book so That's it, it accentuates her kind of state of mind of not being in touch with reality but she is supposedly yeah. representing reality um, yeah that's a good point yeah everything's upside down yeah thank you that's that's amazing <laughs> now i'm thinking about it. thank you um you're the we... ideal student ryan <laughs> <laughs> i can I imagine right <laughs> i can imagine your teachers loved you in school <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them are in the chat right now so <laughs> um, but mm -hmm. I, we have time for about a couple more questions before we have to say goodbye today um let's see if anyone has any more in the chat you can message me or if Anne, if you have any questions to ask rosie <laughs> if any of you have questions for each other um that's also right. We so. could have Rosie recap some of her finest puns. I'm yes, sure. please. <laughs> they're, they're at the front of your mind always, I know. I don't know. I like that. I'm having a heck of a time. <laughs> <laughs> you that haven't sucks. had that? You hadn't come up with that one ever during our project? No, I was trying to be respectful, heck of a so. <laughs> Oh, baloney. <laughs> you were not. <laughs> I like the little sapling pun. I don't know if that was intentional, but like the, the tiny yeah. little, tree, the baby being a little sapling. Yes, that's one. <laughs> you worked that in. <laughs> you seem thrilled. <laughs> Actually, um, I think there's a, a question from Eleni. Eleni Sicilianos. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Hello, Eleni. Hi, Eleni. Where is that? Eleni says... We saw it flash by. Oh, it was gone. Gone in an instant. Hmm. Um, Eleni, do you mind putting your question in the chat again so I can re-get it? <laughs> it was more of an accusation. Oh! Geez, <laughs> I think she said it at dinner the other night. <laughs> it was more oh. of a direct. <laughs> <laughs> she was referring to pun that I said at oh, dinner. Oh, wonderful. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eleni. Oh <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you everyone for who, who has been commenting in the chat and saying whether it's puns or questions we love them both <laughs> and thank you to rosie and thank you Anne, for this 
amazing book that I'm I'm so lucky to, to ask questions <laughs> about. It um, it really made my day, um, and I can't wait to give it away to another person who is going to read it. <laughs> you can find the books online. Um, my associate Marty put it in the in the chat right there. Okay. Um, thank you, good. everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye, Denise. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Ryan. Bye.